Hey everyone, I'm excited to be here. Uh, so as Steve said, I'm going to tell you how to uh, build an entire SSH communication pipelines, uh, pipeline in a matter of minutes, because that's all the time I have during this talk. So my name is uh, Pierre-Etienne Meunier, and I work uh, as a day job for INRIA, which is a research center where I do uh, nano, uh, nano technologies, DNA nanotechnologies, molecular computing in the wet lab, and also in, uh, in theory. Uh, so there seems to be a small problem with this. Okay, it's, it's working all right. Um, okay, so, but I'm not going to talk about molecular computing today. Um, so SSH, I, I believe uh, many people here know about this uh, really cool protocol, uh, which was featured in movies such as The Matrix. Uh, <laughs> and also, which is uh, something we use uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to connect to uh, remote machines. So the way it works is uh, there's, it starts by exchanging symmetric keys using a Diffie-Hellman pro cryptographic protocol. This is really uh, solid, state-of-the-art cryptography. Messages are, during the, the, this key exchange, are signed by the server uh, to make sure there can be no um, man-in-the-middle attack. And then uh, after keys are, if their symmetric keys are exchanged, uh, all the communications uh, are en encrypted symmetrically, which means it's both uh, efficient and super secure. And then after, after this uh, encrypted phase starts, a uh, new number of things can happen, such as uh, clients can authenticate themselves, themselves to the server uh, by signing a message using their public key. Um, it has a number of benefits and uh, drawbacks, trade-offs, compared to other protocols such as TLS. So there's a forward secrecy, which means even if, if the keys are compromised in the future, uh, nothing bad can happen. You cannot recover uh, commu past communications with compromised future, uh, keys in the future. Uh, it's made in Finland, uh, which is a, a, a benefit, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a proven rock-solid protocol. It's had no protocol, but in 15 years, uh, you can proxy it. Although most users uh, use tunnels, which adds, a, adds an extra layer of crypto. Uh, but the main drawback, the main trade-off compared to uh, the small green lock in TLS, uh, is that users have to understand what keys are. They have to uh, keep their secret keys secret and uh, understand what public keys and understand how to check uh, servers, server fingerprints. Um, so as part of a, of a project I was involved in, uh, a Pihul, a mathematically sound distributed version control system, or basically a replacement for Git, um, I, I wrote this uh, library, this crate called Thrush. Uh, it's a 100% Rust, uh, Rust code. It has no unsafe block, um, so no, uh, no escape from the compiler. The compiler will yell at me, and I appreciate that, Liz. Um, so it's, uh, it handles both the clients and the server parts of SSH. Uh, the main reason I wrote that is because I wanted to, uh, I wanted Pihul to be able to push patches to uh, the hosting platform we wrote uh, called uh, called the Nest. Uh, and so I needed a server, uh, an SSH server for that. Uh, it's, it has no unsafe Rust, but it relies on Ring, which is a, a a crate with cryptographic primitives uh, written in a mixture of Rust, assembly, and C. So the main reason I used that and not a, like a hack around OpenSSH is because people is maintained mostly by a small team, or two, uh, on a very limited budget. It's not our main, main job. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, we're basically researchers. Um, and so we, we had little time to uh, to understand how to secure the insecure parts of OpenSSH, such as opening sessions, making sure uh, passwords are set up correctly. And instead of trying to secure them, we figured out it would be much easier and also faster um, and, and uh, involve lef less maintenance just to not implement these in insecure parts. If you can build an SSH server onto which no one can log in, then you're, <laughs> then you're good. <laughs> <laughs> As long as it recognizes just the comments you need, and that's exactly what we need for the Nest, uh, users will see an SSH server from outside, but they, they just won't be able to open a session or to uh, fork a, a remote process. The, they will basically just send uh, exec comments, which will then be parsed by uh, regular expression matching, and, and that's it. And, that's, and then they will, they will 
that we can just call to our to libraries instead of just forking or executing uh, re remote processes. Uh, so my challenge today is to um, uh, build a secure communication channel to a remote server uh, in front of you. So I must warn you, it's the first time I will code in front of someone, and actually it's in front of 200 people. So <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's see. So I'll first. Um, so is this is this big enough, or can I enlarge it a bit? All right. Um, so I'll start with this template. After, uh, you can find that in the Thrush documentation. So it's a template for a server. Basically, what we need is just to import uh, the Thrush crate and the futures crate. So I'd like to, to take this opportunity to uh, thank the author of futures for all the amazing work. Um, well, this is an, an exciting and really cool library. So what, what I do here is I first start here in these two lines by, um, by defining um, my, my server, the, the internals of my server. So this thing needs to implement uh, the clone trait, which is automatically inferred by the compiler. Uh, and the reason it needs to implement it is because it will be cloned every time a client connects, and every client will have its own uh, dedicated version of this structure. So at the moment, we can start with an empty an empty server containing no data, so nothing, nothing interesting can, can, uh, can happen, uh, but that's not a problem, we'll fix it later. Then we implement uh, the Thrush server handler for this, this server. Uh, so there's a bunch of type, types to declare, uh, mostly because um, of technical details in the Rust compiler. There's a, a well, we, we want Thrush to work on this table Rust, so we need to declare this bunch of types here. Don't, don't worry too much about it. And then we'll uh, implement a really insecure authentication mechanism, uh, a public key authentication uh, answering yes to all authentication uh, requests. That's not very secure, <laughs> but uh, it's, not, it's not the point of doing that. It's not the point of my talk today. Uh, the point is, but well, okay, so it's not very secure, but yes, the, public key, the client's public key will be verified. So the client will send a, a, a signed message and the server will check the, 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 the signature, will uh, verify the signature, but just it will accept all requests as long as the uh, clients have signed their message properly. All right, and so inside this function, we just reply with the handler itself, it, itself here and, and a message saying, yeah, we accept it. Oh yeah, okay, then my main is just four lines long. I start with the default configuration. Servers need uh, public keys and secret keys to authenticate themselves to clients. So I'm uh, loading my own personal uh, SSH secret key as the server's key. That's not a problem. I start uh, first instance of the server. It will be cloned later when clients start connecting. And I start the server. And if we run this, um, So I do just a, a cargo run uh, with my server binary, and then I try to connect to it uh, with in debug mode. Um, so what it says here is I connected using OpenSSH, using the OpenSSH client. Uh, so it's, it's doing a number of things here, exchanging keys and stuff. And after a while, it says on this line, authenticated to localhost. So we finally, we have just built a SSH server. It doesn't do much for now. For instance, when I try to type control C here, I'm typing, it doesn't recognize it. It just sends the control C to the server. But since, since we've not written any uh, handling code in the server, the server receives the control C and so it doesn't do anything with it. So in order to cut the connection, my only option is to just kill the server. Uh, so we'll, we'll start improving this server. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write um, a database. Uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to use SSH as a data, database server. So for that, I'll use uh, a hash map. So we need to import it. Uh, I'll, I'll just write a hash map of uh, strings to strings, a key value dictionary. Uh, one issue here is, is, is um, of course, this will implement clone, 
But as I told you, every time a client connects, it's, uh, it clones uh, it clones an instance of that. So the uh, this hash map is not going to be shared. It's actually going to be cloned on every client connected. So that's not really uh, what a database is for. So in order to share things between uh, different uh, different uh, instances, I'm going to use an atomic reference counted value for that. Uh, so I need to import it in the scope again. All right, does it compile? It doesn't compile. Uh, and the reason is, oh yeah, I had not. Initialized the server. All right, now it's compiling. Um, OK, so far it's good. So now I'm, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to define a message uh, type between the clients and servers. So uh, what I'll, I'll have a very simple interface. One is a bind message to add a binding to the server, and another one is a query message to retrieve a string from the server. Uh, and I, I'm going to, um, so SSH only knows about uh, byte slices. It just exchange, exchanges bytes between clients and servers. So I need to, I need to be able to encode this message uh, type as bytes in order to send it to the wire. So the, uh, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to uh, derive the serialize and deserialize traits for it, which automatically adds uh, serialization code for, uh, for this NM. Um, and if I want to be able to do that, I just need to import a number of crates. So I need to import the serialic crates. and the sort of derived crates. And also, uh, I need to choose an encoding. So I choose the bin code encoding. It's a fast, uh, memory efficient, and space efficient encoding of things. And so I am I should be uh, good to go here. So when we <coughs> receive messages from the from the server, so the, this, this server trait, this handler trait, um, it's actually a giant trait with about 50 or 30, I don't know, I don't exactly know, uh, methods. They're, they all have uh, default implementations that don't do a thing. Uh, so they basically just reject requests. And the way to build the server is to override them. So I'm overriding this thing by uh, just implementing a data handler. Um, and I let the types guide me. Uh, so this is supposed to return a unit, I guess, because it's not supposed to return anything else. Um, so here, the type of unit, if I, if I look at the a future unit, it's supposed to return a self and a session. All right, so self and a session. But I didn't receive the session, so I need to add it to the... Uh, server. All right, does it compile? Oh, expected four parameters. Fan three. So I don't remember the types here, and I'm a bit um, too lazy to check the documentation. So I'm just adding a dummy parameter uh, of type unit and let the types guide me. And now look at this error message here. The compiler tells me. You, uh, you gave me a function expecting a unit parameter, and I was expecting a Thresh channel ID. So even if I have no ID, I, well, I'm the author of Thresh, so I obviously have an idea what a channel ID is. <laughs> but even if I have no idea what a channel ID is, is I can just uh, channel ID. Can I just add the parameter here? Oh, it's not in scope. Right, it's now compiling. It's not doing much, but it's compiling. Uh, all right, so now I want to match the message, so I'll use bin code to decode it, because I, uh, I, I derive the implementation trace. Okay, so bin code deserialize returns me a uh, result. So if it's okay of uh, MSG, wait, what was my type again? MSG binds of AB. Um, or if it's just a query, well, if it's an error, I, I won't do anything for now. Uh, it's obviously a prototype. Uh, so if it's a bind, all right, so if it's a bind, what should I do? I should just uh, 
adds the this thing, add this A B this binding to the to the database, and if it's a query, I should and, and well if it's a bind I won't return anything. And if it's a query, I'll return uh the result of that query. Okay. So bin, I'll encode it using bin code. And bin code, I guess, needs a. So that's the serialization. So let's. And I'm sending that serialized thing to the wire. So uh, by using data, so data. Uh, and I think that's that's. Ah, I need to send it to the same channel I received it from. Uh, and there's probably also some other thing I'm forgetting. Maybe there's none in there. Vaguely remember the documentation, but the cool thing is, uh, I'm I'm just going to let the compiler guide me again. Oh, this was a uh, and Sarah was oh I, so bin code can fail. I just need to unwrap it or expect it if you are a little more cautious. Um, okay, so I'll unwrap this one too or expect it if you are a little more cautious. Self that h that insert. So I'm glad here because I've I've passed the first phase of the error of the co of compiler errors, um, of this type checking, and now I need to, as people s call it usually, I need to start the fight the borrow checker phase. Um, so it's not really the borrow checker here. It's uh, just because self that h is um, immutable. So let's make it mutable. Okay, it's still. So I've made it mutable, but it still appears, Im the compiler still sees it as immutable. And the reason is um, because this is an atomic reference counted value, uh, it cannot be shared mutably between, uh, between different threads, and even in the same scope. So I need to, um, I, so, so this is pretty neat here. Uh, instead of letting me into race conditions and uh, concurrency problems, the Rust automatically tells me what to do. Well, it doesn't really tell me what to do here. It just uh, lets me guess that I need to add a lock to my, uh, to my hash map to make it mutable. So I, I, I'm choosing, I could choose different kinds of locks. I'm choosing a, a read-write lock, because that's mostly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm reading and writing. Uh, so I'll, I'll take the lock, the write lock here, uh, and it's and I'll insert uh, stuff into it. And a cool feature of Rust here is that the lock will be automatically released uh, when this value uh, lock moves out of scope here. So let's try again. Oh, no method named no method named insert found from uh, this 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 type result. All right. So this means this was a result. Okay, so I'm, I'm making progress. Um, oops. So I, it seems I have the same issue here. Yeah, obviously, because I've changed the types of my structs. So instead of just letting me do things, uh, Rust complains that it's, that it's not going to work if I ever try to run it. Uh, so, all right. Um, and now I'm still not in initializing my server properly, obviously, because I'm forgotten, I've forgotten to add a lock. All right, so I'm, I'm uh, adding a lock here. And finally, uh, my session is not mutable, so I cannot. Okay, so now it compiles. I've just built an SSH server that takes messages and returns uh, messages from the database. Takes like binding messages to add stuff into the database and uh, answers to queries by uh, by returning the, the values. All right, so now on to building a client for that thing. Uh, so in order to build a client, I first need to move my uh, message type to a different module to be able to share the code between between the client and server. Okay, so we need to make it public. And just replace my uh, previous bindings by like this here. Okay, so from a client, I start from a similar template uh, with an empty, empty uh, client handler uh, implementing a really dummy, uh, useless uh, SSH, implement, like cli SSH client implementa implementation with a similar bunch of types here. Uh, 
And, and uh, an important part here is to check the server key to avoid mining the middle attacks. X. But I won't insist on that too much because it's not, it's not very important. Well, it's actually very, very important for security, but I don't, don't want to enter details of that. And the way uh, my main works is similarly by, uh, by building a default configuration type, instantiating a client, and then starting to connect. And when, I'm, when I connect, I need to pass a, a callback for when the connection actually starts. And this callback will get past this argument connection, uh, after which I can start to authenticate and do stuff. So my client uh, will send a message. After, OK, so let's, 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 get, let's get started. So after, authenticated, after uh, authenticating, sorry, I, I need to, um, so I receive a session. And with this session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a channel. So it's not an X11 forwarding channel, it's just a simple session channel, so that's why it's called session channel. Um, and uh, so I think it's, it works exactly this way. And then when I, re when I receive it, I re I'll receive my session back and a channel ID. Okay. Um, so then I'll return, I'll return uh, finished saying, okay, I'm done with the session, or just finish, I'm done. Okay, so, oh, a typo. It's not compiling. Uh, it's not compiling because I forgot to import the futures trait. So just, just a matter of doing this, and now it is compiling. Okay, so I'm going to send it a message. Um, so the message I want to send is uh, a bind message, and I'm just going to bind the A to B, and I want actually to uh, encode that to bin code. Uh, and without any uh, size limits, I don't care about that for now. Okay, so now I'm going to send this as data. Uh, and I was given a channel ID, so probably I need to use it. Um, and then, and then don't do a thing, no, and then, uh, and then while still uh, return, say that I'm done, return future is finished. Does it compile? It doesn't compile because I don't. So I'm not importing the right things, so I'm just copy pasting them from here. Okay. Does it compile now? Oh, it's not, it doesn't have the MSG module, so this is fixed. Here now it says expecting three parameters, so again I'm going to pass it a just just any parameter. So it, it wants an option, a few 32. So that's, uh, if I remember correctly, so I, I, don't, I don't need to check the doc um, all the time, but if I've checked it before, uh, just, just seeing this type error makes me rea realize that, oh yeah, this is a U32, so what was, what was that needed for again? Uh, okay, it's, it was needed for distinguishing between uh, STD out and STDR uh, on, uh, on the SSH session, so I don't care about that, and it requires an option, so I'm just trying to send it none, and that will work, hopefully. MSG, so it wants a, it wants a borrow, but it says then the borrow is not going to uh, live for long enough, so I don't, yeah, I can just do that, and it's, and it's compiling, all right. So that means I've sent a bind message, uh, but there's not, <laughs> there's not really much I can do with this uh, if I don't send it also a, a retrieve or query message. So I'm just going to copy paste my code here and, and send a send the query message. Oh. All right. Uh, and after this query, I want to wait so after this query, I'm done. But the thing is, I, I've not provided anything to receive messages. So that's where I need to override the 
data thing, the data method, just as it did in the server. So let's just reuse this code <laughs> and see if it works. It's not really working, <laughs> uh, but not surprisingly. So what's the type error here? Expected five parameters found four. So now I remember, yeah, I saw this thing about uh, STD out, STDR, and it needed a U32. So maybe that's it. Let's try. Um, so was it in this position? Yes, it is. So the compiler, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really plain cheat, cheating here, because the, the, <laughs> the compiler tells me it wants an option, so I'm just giving it an option. Uh, And all right, I so since I copy paste pasted code here, it wants a client and it received the server. Um, so what's the matter here? Oh, it's not it's not getting the right thing. Um, session unit maybe. Okay. So obviously, my handling code is not going to be the same as this. I'm going to store messages on a field in the client. So uh, the first option is for, have I received the message already? And the second option is for, uh, is, was this, did the server reply some or none? OK. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, now I need to deserialize what the server says. So the server replies with an option. Um, so I can as well just unwrap it, because I don't need to match. There's only one type of answer I can receive. So self.msg equals sum of that. Is that it? Client. Oh, I'm not initializing my client properly. So MSG none, because I've not received the message yet. And and now this is this was supposed to be mutable here. All right, so let me just make it mutable. Um, and now it's complaining about the channel ID not living long enough. Oh yeah, I need to move it into the closure. OK, it's compiling. Um, so it's compiling, it's receiving messages, and it's not printing out any message. So the thing I need to do, so there's a there's the handling code taking part of receiving message and reacting to that, and then there's this um, driving code I'm writing in the main function, uh, sending out requests and queries and things to the server. So now I just need the session to wait until uh, until it's received uh, a message. Uh, and and that will be it. So there's no field MSG. Oh yeah, because it's I need to use the handler for that. Okay, uh, and I can conclude by just uh, by just printing out the the contents of the message I've received. So I'm printing the debugging output of the of this message uh, handler. MSG, and I know it's not going to be none because I've waited until something arrived. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I need to return. I need to tell futures to shut up. Okay, it's compiling. So now let's try it out. Oh. And that's it. Uh, <laughs> that's it. It's uh, <laughs> so I've just <laughs> so I've, I've just sent a message to the server saying bind a. So if you just look at what I did, I just sent a message to the server saying bind a to b, and then I've sent a message saying okay, what's the value of b for you? And it replies, uh, what's the value of a for you? And it replies, it's, it's b. So I'm done. I've done it. So if, you, if you're interested in contributing, uh, first way to contribute, so uh, Thrush is pretty secure already. 
uh, from a cryptography perspective, it's not doing its own crypto. It's based on Ring, uh, which is a mixture of uh, ASM C, uh, well, Assembly C and Rust, uh, derived from Boring SSL from Google. Um, so, and Thrush is already itself pretty secure. It implements the uh, the, uh, the IETF RFC uh, pretty strictly with annotations of um, of um, links to the relevant portion of the RFC in most places. So a really good way to contributing is simply to use it and report issues. And another way is to uh, review it from a security perspective, because I'm no security expert. I'm, not, I'm no security researcher. Um, one issue we're having is that we're not yet supporting agents, encrypted keys, uh, PGP or whatnot. Uh, people are used to uh, using many things with to, to uh, deal with their public keys. And we're not supporting compression yet. Uh, the repository is on the nest itself, so you can push patches using Thrush, Pihul, uh, to this uh, thing to, to itself. All right, so thanks a lot for listening to this talk. Thanks for your attention, and thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for the rest community. <laughs>